yeah, off she goes, off she goes, and she's burning up. I, I don't want to say it never happened, but it never happened. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Museum Screen Time. My name is Adrian Maldonado. I'm Galloway Horde researcher at National Museum Scotland. I study the early medieval period and the Viking Age, and I'm told there are depictions of this period in video games and movies and televisions. So let's see what that looks like. We are on the eve of battle. You should wear your arm ring, as well as your cross. No. Yes. You need the protection of their god, and of us. I do not think our gods will protect me if I am wearing this. A lot of eyeliner, a lot of eyeliner. An arm ring, okay, silver, it looks like a silver arm ring, as well as a cross. Ooh, I wanted to see that arm ring again. Show me, show me more of the arm ring. Okay, I didn't get a really close look at the arm ring, but it looked like a twisted or a plaited silver arm ring. And we have one of these in our collection from the middle of the 10th century from the scale hoard on Orkney. It's a silver arm ring, beautiful thing. It's not sort of penannular like that one. It's complete circle, but it also has two beasts looking at each other across the terminals. There's a lot of animal art and beast heads on uh, Viking Age metalwork. And the idea with those is that they are sort of animate in some way that the beasts on the art are not just decorative, but they're working as a kind of protection. I'd never kind of seen the arm rings in that protective way as a sort of equivalent to the uh, crucifix uh, for Christians, but I think it's a pretty neat idea. I don't know if we can sort of draw those lines as, as neatly as they do on these shows where you're either Christian or pagan. I think everything we know about the Viking Age is that they're kind of open to a lot of different gods. And in fact, from the same hoard as that silver arm ring I mentioned, the scale hoard, uh, that has thistle and ball type brooches with crosses on them, you know? So I, I, I don't think that there's an either or here. They murder and kill blindly. What is the soul of man? They scar the lands of England. Lands they will never defend, never love. The first word I heard was murder. Brooches, belts, okay, an axe, always an axe. It's, it's funny, we don't have that many axes in the Viking burials in Scotland, which is a little strange. You always associate them with, the, uh, with their axes, but actually what we have a lot of is swords, but not so much axes. And, and it, it might be that uh, maybe they just weren't known for their sort of axe use as much as we think they were later on. Or it could just be that a sword is a better grave good than an axe. Who knows? Uh, and you see them sort of building a peaceful looking settlement. They're building halls here and there's children and what you thought was a vicious Viking warrior is actually someone's dad, I guess. Putting up a statue of a Lewis Chessman, always on brand like that. I like the depiction of a Viking settlement being put up. This thing about Vikings settling in these places and immediately putting up a big, huge longhouse, that doesn't really happen. The best evidence for longhouses is actually a lot later, I found, in Scotland anyway. It's about the 10th century, or about 100 years after the earliest Viking raids, that we have these big timber longhouses being built. So that's another kind of disconnect between the archaeology and our perception of the Viking Age. But I love I like the depiction of uh, settlements being created and women and children uh, coming along with the warrior dudes. Yeah, and I like that it's sort of shades of gray, that there's sort of violence on both sides. Great, that's positive, surely. Uh, and I wonder if the game sort of keeps that up during the gameplay. I wonder, there, you know, the, these games and these movies all kind of depend on this sort of uh, the difference between a Viking on the one side and somebody else on the other side. We know that Anglo-Saxons and Picts went Viking and we know that people who are dressed as Vikings in burials 
come from Britain and Ireland as well. We know from the Galloway Horde that there are Viking Age silver arm rings that are being signed on the back, not with Viking runes, but with Anglo-Saxon runes. And there are English names on these rings. Is there really this stark divide between the Vikings on the one side and the Anglo-Saxons or the Picts on the other side. I think there is scope for a little bit more ambiguity and a little bit more sense of that give and take. I think that's just a healthier narrative to have, a healthier story to tell about the Viking Age than just us versus them. The birth of an England, the idea of a single kingdom called England has to begin here. There is nowhere else. But for how long will Wessex remain? The fate of Wessex will be determined by Englishmen, all Englishmen. Only by joining together and saving Wessex can we have England. Only by saving Wessex can we have a... a Northumbria, a Bebenba. And if Wessex can't be saved? Then we are all no more. The idea of a single kingdom called England. Okay, there certainly isn't a single kingdom called England right now, but I think he's trying to sell people on this idea. Alfred was pretty big into that idea. Some people are calling themselves Saxons and probably a lot of other things like Mercians at this point still. So it's a little bit early for me to say Englishmen or things, but again, I think the point is he's trying to invent the idea or make people comfortable about the idea. So that is in the air at this time. So he's equating Wessex with England because I guess the depiction is of the, uh, the, the Anglo-Saxons cornered by this point and Wessex is the sort of last man standing. I mean, that's the way the sort of, uh, some historians would have you believe this was uh, what was going on at the time. But there is a sense that kingdoms are clumping together at this time into something a little bit more unitary and centralized. But it's not until, you know, the 950s, the end of the 10th century, that you can really start talking about a single kingdom called England. And uh, in the north, you certainly get a kingdom called Alaba at this point. From an English perspective, it's being referred to as Scotia. At this point, it just means the land of the Gaelic speakers. But that term Scotia, later Scotland, is the word that becomes the name of the kingdom over time. <laughs> I don't think he can. First instance of face tattoos. Okay, that's the first face tattoos I've seen. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of those. Oh, oh, there's a bishop. The bishop is wearing chain mail? Am I? No, maybe. Big old cross on the bishop there. Uh, you know, I'm getting strong sort of Galloway Horde pectoral cross vibes. That's pretty cool. Disc brooches on the shoulders? We've got some of those in the Galloway Horde as well. Flags, banners, lots of... Uh, this, is, this is looking a little, a little late medieval for my taste. Again, I just kind of want a close-up on all of the material culture in these videos. Well, what's cool about this, I think, is that there's a, there's a bishop there with a lot of regalia on, as well as chain mail, you know, and, and we do have a sense that there were certainly relics carried into battle, and presumably it's the bishop carrying them, uh, and so there are clergy present at these battles, we know that. One thing that's kind of funny is that they're really amping up the sort of Anglo-Saxons wear a lot of armor and Vikings don't wear any kind of vibe, where they're there's helmets and chainmail on one side and then just face tattoos on the other. Uh, so we can assume that by this point uh, the Viking side will be just as heavily armed uh, as everybody that they're facing, especially given the fact that they're taking down Anglo-Saxon armies left and right. I, I don't know when face tattoos became a Viking thing. It used to be the sort of the Celtic side. I say that, take that with a grain of salt. And now it's kind of everybody who wants to be depicted as a little bit sort of resistancy. At the end of the 8th century, an emissary from Rome visits Northumbria to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And one of the things he says is, all right, guys, you have to stop wearing your hair long like 
barbarians do, and could you stop tattooing yourselves? So there's actually a textual reference of Anglo-Saxons wearing tattoos, just putting that out there. The rise of the MacAlpins to Alba's throne was intended to herald a new era of prosperity. But the coming of the Vikings put pay to them. Their ravaging of our lands has left us divided. Now the throne is shared between Fortrio and the Western Isles claimed by the Vikings. The defeat of the sons of Ragnar to the south brings opportunity. The lands of Alba could be united. Okay, this is great. It's looking a little kind of Bayou Tapestry style. And I'm getting like Lewis Chessmen vibes off of the king and his very sharp beard. The, the depiction of that longship is very similar to those on sort of Gotlandic picture stones and things like that. So that's pretty cool. There's sort of hip scrolls and shoulder scrolls on the horses, which is kind of a, a sort of Pictish style of art, which I like. Uh, okay, this is pretty cool. All right, so it's about the end of the ninth century here, which is an interesting time to set a video game. Actually, it's a great time to set a video game because you can kind of make a lot of stuff up. Uh, there is a kind of a, a, a dark age within a dark age here. Around 875, you have a king of the Picts who is killed, and uh, it's one of many Viking raids that is taking place deep into the heart of the Pictish territories of Fortru, not Fortryu, as they uh, said there. So we know that the Vikings are kind of raiding further and further inland throughout the ninth century. It used to just be on the coasts, but in the 830s, there's a battle in, in what we now call Scotland that takes out the Pictish and uh, Dalriadan kings. Um, and then again and again, 850s, 860s, 870s, there's more and more battles. And then from about 875, we don't really hear anymore for about 25 years. When the sources kind of blink back into existence, in around 900, 903, we begin to hear about kings of a new entity called Alba. So something has changed in those 25 years. So basically, if this video game is set in that window of time, go nuts, you can do anything. We don't really know what's going on, so this is exciting. Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see all the place names here. This is exciting. Uh, I see Govin, spelled in a funny way, Govin. Uh, Altklut, Donali, Donad, those are hill forts. Dunbland, that'll be Dunblane, which is a monastery. Uh, Skorn, with, uh, oh, is that the, the cross of St. Andrew there? Okay, we're, we're not quite there yet in terms of flags, but okay, we'll let that one slide. It's just cool to see uh, old place names of nerdy things like early medieval hill forts in video game settings. So there is a, there is a faction here called the Kirkin faction. I can't tell you how excited I am to see a Pictish word uh, in a video game. That's exciting uh, for true as well, even though it was pronounced in a crazy way. Um, I love seeing these old things depicted in a video game in a popular sort of fashion because they're so kind of strange and foreign, these words, foreign sounding to us. And, and so I like the idea that somebody might dig into these weird old names and look up what it means. What is a Kirkin? What's a Fortryu? And then sort of sneakily learn a little bit of early medieval history. I think that's really, really cool. Thumbs up for me. Okay, so I've got some, I've got some stills from the game here so I can see the individual armies. So I believe I'm looking at the Pictish army because I see a great big Pictish symbol on a banner here. Uh, there's only one Pictish symbol here. They usually come in twos, so, but they usually come on stone. So we don't know if they were used on banners, but let's go with it. The, the one guy in the middle is wearing a brooch on one shoulder, the right shoulder. So that is exactly how the brooches would have been worn. Whether they wore their fancy silver brooch in the heat of battle is another question. Hey, 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 hey. Wait, wait, wait! Those men in the boat, who are they? North man, keep moving and keep quiet. Ah. Why? Are they dangerous? It depends. Maybe they'll let us go, or maybe they'll kill us. I am an ambassador, damn it. I am supposed to talk to people. You may yet have the opportunity. Mm. 
This story is based on the, uh, the real life figure of, of Ibn Fadlan, who was sent as an emissary from the court of Baghdad, the center of the Islamic world at this time, the Abbasid caliphs. Uh, he's being sent to the uh, Bulgars of the north to explain to them how the Muslim religion works, basically. Okay, we've got a long ship, long ship alert. Um, uh, this is unfortunate. Okay, I mean the long ship, great. Yeah, I mean certainly these are being used in the in the big rivers of the time, uh, the Volga in particular. Unfortunately, that long ship seems to be based on one from the British Museum. It's from the River Scheldt in uh, Belgium, uh, and it was long thought to be Viking, and it's on the cover of lots of books about Vikings. It's been radiocarbon dated. It's the sixth century. It's a Germanic, I suppose, uh, ship, but. Not Viking by uh, several centuries, I'm afraid. And here we see a sort of Viking camp on the banks of the river there. You can tell because there's long ships parked on the water there. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, Nice sort of uh, slice of life here. We associate the beginning of the Viking Age with the raid on Lindisfarne in 793 and Iona in 795, their settlements in England and in Ireland. But actually, most of the action at this time is expansion further south and east because in the Islamic world, in the Byzantine world, that's where the good silver is coming from. And not just silver, exotic goods like spices and uh, other materials that you can't get in the west. There are silks coming from the Silk Road even further east. And we know this because we are getting Arabic coins called dirhams in hordes as far as Scotland and Ireland. So we know Islamic silver is flowing through these trade routes. We also know from fantastic finds like the Galloway Hoard, which has silk, which has all of this silver and all these exotic materials like uh, uh, glass beads and things. We know that there's a lot of this material coming from as far as Central Asia into the Viking Age world of Scotland and Ireland. Fort in the middle of a moor plus Wicker Man. Whoa, okay, there's definitely a there. That's the Wicker Man right there. Okay, so are, yeah, I don't know who these people are. Are these the are these supposed to be like Picts or Vikings? Okay, so I don't know what just happened to me uh, right there, but it was pretty wild. I'm interested in whatever's going on. The new metal singer with the face tattoos is the Celtic side, the sort of indigenous side, and there are Viking raiders. So this is interesting because usually it's the Vikings who are depicted as these sort of uh, vicious, otherworldly, just freaky deaky warriors uh, with horned helmets and, 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 and in, in some movies they're even more monstrous. Uh, but here it's the sort of the Picts, I guess, or the, the anyways, the people in the uh, who are being raided by Vikings, who are the sort of crazy, freaky deaky face paint monsters. So I don't know if that's progress. Yeah, that's something different. So thanks for that. Oh, okay, she's a Pict. Yeah. From Orkney. I don't think that hillfort's in Orkney. Anymore. No, that doesn't look that. doesn't look like an Orkney mountains. landscape. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Ha uh ha. -huh. This is definitely, this is definitely retrograde, I'm afraid. I was really into it for a minute there, but now we're talking about the pics as these crazy, heathen, uh, heavy metal video uh, off casts. I don't know if I need that in my life, really. If we're talking about Orkney at the beginning of the Viking raids, you're talking about a landscape that is dotted with crosses in stone. Uh, people are 
pretty safely Christian at this time. Uh, There's several monastic handbells and cross slabs and things that you associate with monasteries, and they've been on Orkney now for a century or more at this point. In fact, there's Viking burials that take place amongst uh, what look like Christian burial grounds. So uh, I don't think we necessarily need to make the pigs into the freaky deaky super pagans anymore, but I'm glad as a change of pace, it's not the Vikings who are being depicted as crazy monsters, but uh, yeah, I don't really need it. Food offerings in bowls, okay, that's that's all legit. We certainly get that in Viking graves of the time. Offerings, offerings made by different people. So we have this sense of Viking burials as everything that the person was wearing at the time, but there's actually a lot of evidence that, you know, these things were laid out there very carefully. And I like the idea of different members of the community uh, doing the job of laying things out. I like that a lot. A horse's head, wow, okay, that that is really cool, okay. There is one really wealthy woman's grave uh, that she's known in the literature as the Gausel Queen, uh, and she is arrayed with lots of grave goods, lots of stuff looted from the insular world, from Britain and Ireland, you know, and yeah, so close to her feet, there is a horse's head uh, completely laid out with its sort of bridle. So she's, I, I thought she was on a boat, but it's on wheels, so maybe it's like a boat-shaped beer or something that's gonna be carded somewhere. Nope, nope, it's just a boat, it's a boat, it's a boat. I was kind of hoping we would stay away from the let's burn a boat on the water thing, but here we go, Viking burial. This view, this view over here, it looks like an archeological diagram. You usually get the drawing of these graves from this sort of God's eye view, just like you're getting here, like from above. And you can see all the grave goods very clearly laid out. You can use this in class except for the fact that I think they're about to burn her in the water, like shoot a flaming arrow. Is that what's happening? Is that is that where we're about to get here? Yeah, off she goes, off she goes, and she's burning up. The thing is that we have a lot of boat burials and they're always on land. That's the thing. I, I don't want to say it never happened, but it never happened. I think it's great that we're getting a depiction here of a high status woman's burial. Uh, certainly we have lots of these represented in our collections here and uh, anywhere that there's Viking burials, frankly. And in some cases, the woman's burials are the ones that are arrayed with the, uh, uh, the most elaborate grave goods and burial offerings, you know. In Scotland, uh, one of the wealthiest uh, burials, if you go by the number of objects that's in the grave, is a woman from West Ness and Rouse say in Orkney and she's wearing, like the Gausel Queen in Norway, she's wearing Scandinavian dress items, Irish and Scottish dress items, even Northumbrian dress items. So she's kind of dressed up from gear that's been gathered from all over. They're kind of showing all of their trading networks and all the places that they have contacts with in these graves. You know, traditionally, uh, you know, you, you spoke about women's burials in the Viking Age as the wives of warlords and chieftains and kings, and that these were the things that they brought home. And I think increasingly we are seeing that some of the things that are being buried with these women are things that they perhaps owned or things that were part of their community, uh, uh, offerings that were made to them because they were respected in their own time. I think in short, it's uh, it's really good to see a woman sort of being buried uh, with a lot of pomp and circumstance uh, for her own deeds in life, presumably. Uh, I haven't seen the show, but that's what it seems like. 
Well, we've been through a lot here today. Uh, this has been eye-opening. In one sense, I'm not really surprised. There was a lot of shields and axes and blood and face tattoos. So I kind of expected that going in when you're talking about the Viking Age. That's kind of the image that you have in your head. Of course, the big story of the Viking Age is not just hacking and burning, but also trade and, you know, uh, uh, merchants, women and children. They're all part of the story here. They're all moving along at this time. Uh, what we're talking about with the Viking Age is a, an age of expanded horizons. One thing I'm less excited by is that you keep seeing this sort of really hard divide between the Vikings on one side and everybody else on the other. That's something that the archaeology just doesn't bear out. If you want more about the kinds of stories that the artifacts can actually tell you, these global connections from Scotland to Central Asia, I wonder if there's any books that you can read. Oh, wait, this one sounds interesting. Crucible of Nations by Adrian Maldonado. Hey, pick that up in any bookstore near you. That's a lot of what we've been talking about today. The stories that I'm interested in about the Viking Age are in here. So uh, that's out now. Okay, thanks for watching. I had a really good time. Uh, I'm traumatized by some of these clips, but I'll try to get over it, okay? See you next time.